Welcome to the Archetypal Mosaic. This is Mikhail Tank. On the phone I have an incredible PhD professor, Emeritus of Philosophy, William Stevens, who is an author whose interests include ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, Stoicism as a way of life, Stoicism in popular culture, ethics, animals, and the environment. Welcome. Thank you, Mikhail. Um, William, so today we're going to be focusing specifically on the concept of Stoicism and basically how to live that kind of a, a life and a way in order to survive in this world. You have a new book uh, coming out. If you can please uh, tell the audience a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so um, actually this is a reprint of an English translation of a book on the ethics of the Stoic Epictetus that was authored by a 19th century German scholar named Adolf Bonhoeffer. And I translated this, uh, the, bon, the this uh, second of three books that Bonhoeffer wrote in Epictetus, uh, was published by Peter Lang a number of years ago. And it has continued to be so popular because of the rise of interest in Stoicism that the publisher uh, and I agreed that we should do a revised edition. And that's what's going to be coming out in the next month or so. Wonderful. Will it be available at all the major bookstores, Amazon, etc.? It will. It will. And for more information, definitely visit Mr. Stevens at williamostevens.com. Uh, now, let's begin uh, about talking what is Stoicism and how did it come to be known? Okay, so Stoicism is a school of the ancient Greek Hellenistic period. Hellenistic means Greek like. And this was the period several centuries uh, before the common era. Uh, just after the death, uh, around the death of Alexander the Great. So around 300 before the Common Era, uh, a gentleman named Zeno of Kidium. Kidium is a city on the Isle of Cyprus. Zeno of Kidium uh, came to Athens and uh, began teaching this. He, he became a student to several philosophers, one of whom was a uh, Cynic philosopher. And he developed his own new philosophy of life uh, that he began teaching in what is known as the Painted Porch, the Stoa Poiehile, in the Agora, the marketplace of ancient Athens. And so Stoa is a kind of architectural structure. It's a covered walkway or colonnade or more colloquially, a porch. And so since the gentleman, since the men who hung out with Zeno and learned his teachings, discussed philosophy at that location, that building in ancient Athens, those who did that philosophy, those who discussed it and lived by that philosophy, came to be known as the denizens of the Stoa or Stoics. Got it. And as an archetype, it reminds me of, for example, Noah's Ark. Or can you bring about some archetypes which basically tell us about the root of the house that you are uh, cover yourself in, like a turtle? Or what kind of things come about archetypally? Well, uh, archetypally, you, you mean in terms of architectural structure? Sure, or the image thereof, so that a person who is more image-based can imagine and pretty much input that, the power of Stoicism into themselves through an animal, a totem, a symbol, an image. Sure, okay. Well, uh, I guess Stoicism, because of the, the covered walkway and the columns uh -huh. that are integral to a Stoa, um, I suppose that the image of a of a column, a Greek column, um, would be a kind of archetype. Um, another one that suggests itself to me uh, comes from a quotation from a later Roman Stoic, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, who describes Stoicism and the stance of the Stoic in the maelstrom of events beyond one's control as safe inside of a citadel. And so Stoicism, I think, in the imagination can be associated with uh, living in a stronghold or a castle because you have protection all around you from what 
Shakespeare called the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, right? The things beyond your control that assail you throughout life. You're safe inside your citadel if you're a Stoic. And, but, mm-hmm. yeah. All right, go ahead. Also, in a situation, before we continue with the main questions, in a situation such as, let's say, a tsunami or a hurricane, or being in an enclosed environment with a lot of people, maybe like in a hospital or in some kind of a location where you don't feel comfortable with others surrounding you or with bad weather surrounding you, what is the best way to remain stoic when uh, there are external circumstances or people or weather which can make you feel fear? Right. Very good question. So I would say that what's characteristic of the Stoic way of thinking, the Stoic approach to life, is that it begins on the inside and then turns outward. And what I mean by that is that one of the fundamental distinctions that the Stoics make is between the things that are always completely, by their very nature, up to you or up to me, and the things that are not always completely by their very nature up to me. This is a fundamental distinction that Stoics make all the time in coping with situations that they face in life every day. And so the weather is an excellent example. The behavior of other people is an excellent example. These are things that are beyond one's control. They're not up to me. I have absolutely no control over the weather. And so what I need to do is to turn inward and recognize that though the weather is not up to me. How I handle myself, how I think about the weather, the decisions that I make about how to act, the judgments that I make about the weather and about how I should behave, all of those things are completely up to me. So I'm responsible for how I handle myself on the inside, my thoughts, my reactions, my judgments, and my feelings that emerge in consequence of the judgments that I make. And so fear for the Stoics is something that results from a judgment that one has control over, that something that is approaching, something imminent, is bad. And so judging that thing that's coming my way to be bad is what results in the emotion of fear. Okay, so peace of mind, calmness, equanimity, is a condition of one's mind that one can appropriate, take, take, take on, right? Assume that outlook and then looking outward from this internal stability and calmness, then choose how to deal with those factors beyond one's control in the right sort of rational way. And when we talk about rational, it's interesting because the opposite of rational in Stoicism appears to be pathos, which is the passions of the soul, right? Well, that's right. So, so in Greek, pathos is something that happens to you. It's something that, that happens to that, that that arises in you uh, beyond your control. So um, pathos is an emotion uh, or passion. And the Stoics believe that uh, most passions are disturbing to one's rational thinking, to one's uh, intellectual operations. So fear, anger, grief, envy, resentment, hatred, spitefulness, malice, all of these things are disturbing pathe in the plural, passions of the soul, that destroy your peace of mind and the smooth flow of your life. And so the Stoics believed that it was absolutely vital to get a grip on one's judgments and make proper judgments about what's really good, what's really bad, and what's neither good nor bad in life in order to rid oneself of these disturbing, violent passions of fear and anger and envy and all these other negative feelings. What about the positive passions like love, sensuality, expression, creativity? What, where do those lead to? Right. So the Stoics distinguished from these negative pathe that I that I listed. Right. Three three eupithei. In Greek, there's three good feelings. Uh-huh. 
So the three good feelings that they identified were joy, caution, and rational wishing. So joy is the counterpart for a Stoic to the kind of frivolous giddiness or the kind of elation that someone might have if they find a $20 bill on the sidewalk, right? A Stoic would say, happening upon some money is not truly a good event because it does nothing to improve oneself, one's true self, which is going to be one's soul, or to put it in more secular terms, uh, one's moral character, right? It's not gonna make someone wiser or more just or more courageous or more generous. So coming into some money by accident, that's not really going to be something that counts as contributing to one's happiness. The only way to contribute to true happiness is to become virtuous and cultivate the virtues of wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance or self-control. So that's the good feeling of joy. The feeling of caution is the Stoic's counterpart to what non-Stoics experience as fear. If you're driving an automobile, if you're in a hazardous situation, you need to be alert. You need to be mindful and calm, but also try to cultivate a feeling of self-confidence that you can navigate that hazardous situation and act appropriately. And that is the emotional uh, stance or the emotion, the good feeling that a Stoic would refer to as caution. And then the third one, rational wish, is the emotion or the feeling of wanting good things, for example, for one's friends. So if your friend has been working hard at her job and she's up for promotion, then you can form the, the provisional or you can, you can experience the provisional good feeling of wishing that she gets that promotion. But it's only going to be a provisional sort of uh, deportment because you recognize that whether or not your friend, friend gets a promotion or not is ultimately not going to be up to her. It's going to be up to her employer. And so actually the thing to wish for her is not that she gets a promotion at work, but rather wish for her things that are truly good, which are what? The virtues. Okay, great. Before we get to the virtues, what other benefits of the soul are there in Stoicism? For example, um, for example, yeah. like uh, I've been to Athens, thank God, I've been to Delphi. You know, when the oracle spoke, um, they provided, you know, potential wisdom potential caution to people. Um, the soul was moved to a way to, um, like we have in our dreams, we can have warnings, visions, images. Um, in Stoicism, aside from these, these positive three traits you discussed, are there any other benefits that the soul can do for humans? Well, yes, it, 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 for, so for Stoics, uh, happiness is entirely a matter of the condition of one's soul. It, it doesn't arise from external circumstances at all. So, you know, how the stock market is doing, what my portfolio is doing, um, even my physical health, right? These things are not true sources of happiness, according to the Stoics. Rather, the condition of my soul dictates how well my life is going to go for me. So, again, Things beyond my control are going to happen. How well I deal with them is going to be up to me. Got it. So cultivating equanimity and acting fairly, right? Trying to be just in uh, my dealings with other people. Uh, that's going to be up to me. Whether I exhibit courage in dealing with scary or risky situations, that's going to be up to me. So this, this is what is in Marcus really is talking about when he talks about being able to um, to to retreat within right retreat into himself into his soul and recognize that he has these resources that can in fact benefit or save the soul from despair and grief and uh, and resentment or envy or fear, right? These are the psychic resources, the resources of the soul that we can avail ourselves on of 
anytime, any place. And then, if somebody gets into this kind of a situation where they need to use these resources that you mentioned and become a stoic in order to survive and thrive through a situation, um, what, how would you say if somebody who is who understands these things but can't seem to to get them or to utilize them, what's the best way to activate these benefits from within? Right. So, so this is the importance of practice or training, right? It's one thing to kind of understand the teachings of Stoicism, the doctrines, the beliefs that Stoics have. But what's absolutely vital, of course, is being able to apply them. And not apply them just once in a while, but apply them all the time, every day, in every situation, rehearsing in one's mind. Is it up to me or is it not up to me? If it's not up to me, then I have to I have to focus on what is up to me and responding appropriately and focus on that. Not what other people are going to do, not what other people are going to think or say. Those things will be on my control. But trying to be the best person I can be, trying to behave in a way that I would admire if I saw that behavior in another person, right? Those are the things that are up to me. And it takes practice. So one Stoic therapy that Seneca discusses is reflecting at the end of every day on the things that he did that day, how he reacted to different situations, whether he found his anger rising and how he managed that, or whether he started to feel disappointment and then took a step back and recognized, okay, well, I did the best I could with what was up to me, and so disappointment is not an appropriate response. So the goal for the Stoic is to try to make progress in managing these reactions and to try to make progress in practicing them and applying them over time, recognizing that you're not going to become fully wise overnight or over the course of a week or a month. Rather, the Stoic, the great Stoic teacher Epictetus used the image of comparing yourself to an athlete who aspires to compete and win in the Olympics. Stoics are Olympic athletes of the soul. And so when you recognize the discipline and the strictness and the seriousness of daily habits that athletes have to cultivate day in and day out, week in and week out, month after month, in order to hone and perfect their physical abilities and make progress with their greater strength and speed and balance. The dedication that Olympic athletes exhibit is inspiring to a Stoic teacher like Epictetus, who is trying to inculcate in his students an equal amount of serious dedication to crafting their souls as if they were carpenters chiseling a block of wood and trying to make a beautiful statue, right? The material that they work with is precisely their souls. And that means their judgments, their beliefs about what's good, bad, and indifferent, their reactions to things, and their attempts to live justly, fairly, uh, generously, courageously, and compassionately construed the right sort of way. It's beautifully said. You brought up two beautiful images with the chiseling and the Olympics. Very clear, beautiful images. Before we get to virtue, I want to ask you how ego, God, and indifference are related to Stoicism. Three separate things. Ego, yes. Okay, well, I mean, uh, so the Stoics recognize that the, that the self, the ego, uh, has these kinds of relentless desires for, for things, right? And this is, in fact, how they diagnose the grief and the hardship and the suffering that so many people fall into because they turn outward looking for things that they think will make their life better instead of turning inward and recognizing that happiness as a state of mind has to arise from a condition of that same mind. So when you judge yourself to be superior with respect to your good looks or your clothing or your automobile 
or the home that you live in, or the job that you have, or the social status and fame that you enjoy. Stoics will remind themselves that all of these things are fleeting. Every beautiful person is going to develop wrinkles over time, and their hair will turn gray or fall out, right? The wealth that they have, it might grow, but it might also be taken away. And in any case, is impotent to purchase virtue, calmness of soul, generosity of spirit. These things can't be purchased at any shop, not at Amazon.com, nowhere, right? right? So ego is a kind of internal enemy, as it, as it were, because it deflects you from recognizing your shortcomings and your weaknesses which you can work on improving, right? So to be clear-eyed and avoid self-deception and falling into the falling prey to the, the, the pitfall of egoism, Stoics are going to focus on what they can do to perfect themselves, to make them better. And this is a key point to understand, because when Stoics describe the goal in life as living in agreement with nature, as they do, for human beings, they believe that our special endowment was reason. So living in agreement with nature meant living in agreement with reason. And then what is reason perfected? Well, Stoics believe that the perfection of reason is simply what virtue is. That's what virtue is. It's not some sort of mysterious, um, you know, ghost-like condition of the mind. Virtue just is the perfection of reason. It just is judging and acting and behaving wisely and courageously and justly. All of these are just different names applied to different spheres of action. Beautiful, beautiful. Well said that uh, virtue is the perfection of reason. That's a very clear... That was going to be one of my next questions, so you, you define that. Uh, the, the other two uh, items is, uh, how does God come into Stoicism? Can there be a relation? Are they separate entities? Can they be united in parallel? And then also the concept of indifference. And is indifference really, in your opinion, the opposite of love as opposed to hatred? Yes, good. So a lot to say about indifference. So so responding first to the question about God. So the Stoics believe that the cosmos, and the Greek word means world order. So the very notion of a disordered universe is, is anathema to Stoic thinking, right? It's an orderly place. Things are organized. They're structured very clearly. We can discern that structure with our intellects. So the cosmos is an orderly world, is a single living organism. And the active laws of nature, as we would describe them, control the movement of things made of matter. So the Stoics conceived of Theos, God, as precisely that active principle which organizes and structures the entire universe. Therefore, living in agreement with nature, which is how they define the goal of life, means, among other things, living in agreement with that orderly, structured flow and unfolding of events in this rationally structured world. Which is to say that they believe that we have to conform our desires to the way that the world happens, to how things unfold. The, the, you have a wonderful image of the relationship between our human place in the world and the world itself, and they liken this to a dog that is leashed to a moving wagon, and the wagon is rolling forward. The wagon is the universe, and the dog has a choice. The dog can either choose to walk behind the moving wagon, since it's attached by the leash to it, and keep pace with it and go in the direction that, it, that the wagon goes, or the dog can choose to resist and dig in and try to fight against the direction that the wagon is going. And if that's the choice the dog makes, then it'll get dragged anyway. So the world is going to take us the direction that it's going in no matter what. What's up to us, then, is how well we deal with the things that do happen, again, focusing on the things that are up to us. And so 
living in agreement with nature is just what the Stoics mean by accepting what God wants. The universe unfolds the way that God wills it to unfold. And our happiness does not consist in trying to resist it or overturn that because we have no power to do so. Rather, we have to conform our will to God's will. And that means accepting what happens, but then doing the best we can to make the contributions in our role as or many roles that we identify ourselves with in life to try to make the world a better place to the extent that it's up to us. So it does not mean passivity. This is a common misunderstanding. I was just, gonna, I was just thinking that. But yes, I was just thinking that exact thing. Right. So, so, Stoics, so when you accept the way the world is, this doesn't mean that you, you just lie on your couch and watch TV all day. Because, again, remember, the Stoics believe that the only true goods are these virtues. And so if you value your justice more than anything else, if you value being as just a person as you can possibly be, then this is going to manifest itself in all of your actions. You're going to be fair and just in your dealings with strangers and your closest friends and family members alike. And so insofar as the Stoic is absolutely committed to living justly and being just, this means, as I interpret Stoicism, contributing as a member of society to making your community a better place, both locally and globally. So there's not there's no passive uh, posture here where the Stoic just lets things happen. No, the rationality, the virtue of a Stoic is precisely measured by how virtuously he responds to what the world throws her way and what happens. Great. Uh, and finally, the concept of indifference as it relates. So... When Stoics talk about judging what things are good, what things are bad, and what things are indifferent, what they mean is there are things which are neutral. So take, for example, possessions, right? Or take a common possession like a tennis racket. I play a lot of tennis myself. So a tennis racket is a piece of sporting equipment, which in itself has no value with respect to my happiness. So, for example, I don't need to carry my tennis racket around with me when I'm not playing tennis. It has no value in itself when I'm not on the tennis court, right? It's a tool. And when I am on the tennis court, my, my skills, my tennis virtue, if you will, my tennis ability, is measured precisely by how well I use my tennis racket when I'm playing the game of tennis, in itself, however, it is indifferent. And so if I were to forget my tennis racket and leave it on the tennis court and I lost it, this would not detract from my ability as a tennis player because that is internal to me, right? I've internalized these different micro skills in playing tennis and I could replace that racket with a new one and get back out on the tennis court. Let me ask you so, a follow-up about the tennis racket. What, for example, let's say the tennis racket is signed by Billie Jean. Let's say it's uh, blessed by the Pope and it's a collector's <laughs> racket that costs you know, $5,000 and you you have it in, near and your mom kissed it. So it has all yeah. of these benefits and it's a good luck racket and it can never yeah. be replaced. Does that change? Right. So, so a Stoic would, would, I think, pretty emphatically reject the very notion that a physical object can bring you good luck. Okay. Now, now, I take your point that as an object, it has its own history, and it's going to be different than other tennis rackets that don't receive the blessing from the Pope and aren't signed by you know, the tennis celebrity. But a Stoic is going to be quite skeptical about the notion of celebrity, right? My ability to use that racket well is independent of whether it is signed by Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal, who gave it to me, how much money I paid for it, what, what other people have done to or with the racket. It's going to be independent of those things. And the most important thing, the most important lesson to draw from losing the tennis racket is this. If I choose to invest some degree of my happiness 
in the condition and the continued possession of a tennis racket, then what I'm doing is I'm choosing to make my very happiness at risk. I am endangering, I am making contingent upon the, the world unfolding a certain sort of way that I will always keep this racket, that it'll never get cracked or damaged when I'm trying to hit a low ball and it ends up scraping against the court. And those things are what? They're beyond my control. Hmm. So it would be very foolish for anyone to invest their happiness in any kind of physical possession that is ultimately beyond their control because these things do not last forever. They can get damaged, they can get broken, they can get stolen, and they can they can be lost. And if I invest my happiness in any of my physical possessions, including my wealth in whatever form it takes, my material wealth, if I choose to invest my happiness in any of those things, then instead of me using them as tools, I am, in fact, making myself a slave to them. Because if my happiness depends on what happens to them and it's beyond my control, then they are the master of me. I am no longer the master of them. That, that's very clear, very beautifully said. Uh, how does that relate to people? Let's say you have a brother or sister that you love. And let's say you know something happens to them. They fall off a bridge accidentally or something. Uh, God forbid. Does that, the fact that your relationship with somebody that you love, um, you know, provides you with strength and, and, you know, courage and many other things, and then you lose that person, um, how is that, how is that different from your favorite tennis racket? From a very good. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good question. Very good question. So, the crucial distinction that Stokes would draw would be between inanimate objects that are tools or instruments that can be useful for achieving some practical goal, but as such are inanimate. You don't have a relation I don't have a relationship with my tennis racket. It's a tool it's a tool that I use like a pen or an eraser or a pencil. Human beings are very different because human beings we do have robust and complex relationships with. Human beings are in reciprocal relations with each other in an organic, dynamic co community and society itself. And as such, we are citizens. We are fellow travelers on the bus or a plane with fellow human beings. We have siblings. We have sons and daughters, nieces and nephews, aunts and uncles, parents, grandparents, second cousins, and all the rest. And so this complex web of social and personal and familial relationships is an enormous source of our own personal identity. And as such, we are responsible for, again, doing what is up to us to maintain and and complete and fulfill these relationships, these many different kinds of relationships we have with so many different people that we interact with every day. We have a responsibility to be the best son and father and nephew and uh, fellow citizen and fellow neighbor and fellow tennis partner, right? All of these different relationships that, and associations that we engage in. We have a uh, responsibility to fulfill all of those different social and familial roles to the very best of our ability. That said, we also have to recognize that all living things, the moment they come into existence, are fated to die. And the Stoics emphasize relentlessly the importance of keeping before our eyes every day the possibility of death, of injury, of illness, and of loss. What follows from that is not that we shouldn't love the people that we love, because it's only human to love the people. Is feeling like a statue, but once we have children, we can't not love them as our offspring. So Stokes recognize that love is an extremely natural and appropriate phenomenon or manifestation of our deeply social nature as human beings in community with each other. 
So the challenge then for us is to love our family and friends and get to know associates and make new friends and to love them, but to love them as human beings, reminding ourselves that that means that they don't belong to us. They are not indestructible. They are not impervious to the coronavirus. They are not impervious to accident and aging and ultimately death. And so for a Stoic, it's important that we f reflect both on our own mortality and recognize that we can't stop the clock. We can't cease aging. We have to deal with our own infirmities and our own physical challenges and disorders as we age and we deal with illness and disease and accident. But the same applies to other people. We're still going to love them, but we recognize that we can't just put them in a box and carry them around in our back pockets safe from any changes that the world would would uh, might might bring about in them that's not up to us that's beautifully said um i'd like to ask you this question so in, in humanity since people you know can be evil um and can create scapegoats of other people we've seen this happen in history that the jewish people have been you know, uh, th thrown away from places due to various envies, jealousies, and many other things. When, when there's a people who are a scapegoat, when there's a dominant party who is, I would say, the evil party, can easily create scapegoats out of minorities or people who don't fit in and create stories about them and try to remove them in some way or another. How does a Stoic deal with that as being the scapegoat? Right, yes, excellent question. So, so again, notice, notice the origin of, of the phenomenon of the practice, the unjust practice of scapegoating. As you say, it might arise from envy or hatred, lack of understanding. All The origin then of evil, in this case, is precisely ignorance. It's a failure to understand how things really are. Because human beings of all races and all genders and orientations, right, all ethnic backgrounds all over the world have far, far, far more in common than we have different. Despite differences in our, our, our religions, our, our political outlooks, right, our, our sensibilities with regard to, to justice and art, or food and how, how we're related to, to animals and we use our environment, however that is. So the, the, the origin of that, that objectionable evil, as you called it, is a failure to understand. And so this follows the ancient Platonic teaching that all error arises ultimately from ignorance. To know the good is to do it. To fail to know the good is going to lead to problems. So that's that's going to be the diagnosis of the origin of this kind of evil scapegoating. So what's the correction? What's the remedy? The remedy has to be proper education. That's the only silver bullet that's going to solve ignorance is proper education. Okay. Now, when it comes to teaching, What's up to you is to teach the best you can these principles of fairness and equity and compassion and at least minimally tolerance, right? How people respond to that Stoic teaching is, of course, going to be up to them. And, and a lot of people are not going to respond positively to it. Okay, so that's beyond one's control. So then what do you do? When you deal with people, how do you how do you handle people? How do you respond to people who are not accepting that lesson that you are trying to impart? And the response there again is to focus on what's up to you and to organize. There's nothing in Stoicism that advises against grassroots movements to try to establish and improve the political standing of scapegoated groups. So insofar as you judge that a particular political course of action is the just and right thing to do, a Stoic will be dedicated to it 100%. Wonderfully, wonderfully put. Very helpful, I think, will be to many people. A few more questions as we get closer to the completion of this excellent interview. Um, the first one is how virtue 
is connected to heaven and the concept of that and vice how it's connected to sin and as human beings since so uh, i mean it's kind of a balancing act how does that all work in stoicism okay so the concept of sin a stoic is going to understand simply in terms of mental error or ignorance right and the reason is because the stoics do not believe in any afterlife they have an imminent conception of God and the divine as the rational organizing principle in the universe that is imminent in it. So Stoics have a kind of, and, and here it can get a little bit complex, but it's not inaccurate to describe Stoics as a kind of pantheists, right? Where the divine is here in the world. There's not a separate heavenly or hellish existence on a different different plane of existence. So that's just to say that Stoics don't believe in heaven or hell. Another way of putting it, however, is that uh, a kind of heavenly experience on earth is, is approached when one is living in harmony in society, in community with other people. And love is shared and shown and practiced within a group. That's a heaven-like experience. And it's not beyond our grasp. It is something that we can experience or perhaps even have experienced at different times and different places during our lives. So on the other hand, the other side of the coin would be what would be a hellish experience? Well, this would be one in which people are so blinded by ignorance and a failure to understand what's good, bad, and indifferent that they are motivated exclusively or what seems to be exclusively by hatred mm -hmm. right malice and spite leading to violence which is why the roman stoic seneca one of his most magnificent works is called de era on anger and he does a masterful job of describing how when anger takes control of someone's life and conduct and behavior violence is always within reach violence almost always erupts from anger that runs out of control and that's precisely why he offers stoic therapies to analyze that what anger is that it is an emotion that flows from a judgment that i've been wronged by someone i did not deserve to be wronged and coupling that with the judgment that the appropriate thing for me to do is to lash out and seek retaliation two different mental judgments are what give birth to the emotion of anger. It's not something that happens to us. It's something that we create in our own minds for ourselves as a result of those two judgments that are up to us to control, right? And so violence as a phenomenon is all too common a consequence of giving in to the irrationality of anger, which he describes as a kind of temporary insanity we lose our capacity to think clearly, to reason, and to look in a circumspect way at the big picture when we fly into a rage because of some perceived slight that someone has wronged me and that I ought to retaliate. Um, that would be a kind of hellish situation, is to lose one's reason permanently and, and just lash out violently. That would be a hell-like behavior of a beast. Very, very... Ima lots of imagery uh, that, that you, when you speak I just see pictures um, let me ask you this question which is in the back of my mind which is so in, in, in life you know there like you said things happen in life obviously the good and the bad the indifferent the ugly the beautiful and when certain things come and shock people they the people are like I can't believe this happened you know I can't believe a tire uh, from one side of the freeway fell onto a car onto the other yeah. side of the freeway and just killed someone this happened recently in the news I saw it and um, I actually experienced something like this many years ago when a tire from the other side of the freeway almost hit the top of my car but I I don't I don't know where it went because I swerved away. But my point is that um, when things like that happen, things which are shocking, unbelievable, how does a Stoic accept the most shocking things that life gives? Really excellent question. So glad you asked this. So 
again, the daily among the arsenal that a Stoic avails herself of every day and reflecting on how things went the day before is to anticipate what's going to happen tomorrow and the things that could happen. And this is the therapy of decatastrophizing that Stoics have have done such a wonderful job of of teaching to us and sharing with us. And the, the, the approach is this. This is how the method works. These events, which seem to come out of left field that we were not anticipating, are just the sorts of things that have gone on for years and centuries and millennia. There is nothing new under the sun that happens to human beings now that didn't happen decades or centuries or millennia ago. Now, it's true that technology changes. And because of anthropogenic global climate change, there are changes to the environment. But it's hardly the case that weather events, hurricanes, droughts, wildfires, anything like that, right? Tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, all of these things happened to the ancient Romans. Diseases, pandemics, and epidemics, this is not new at all. And so what's so important is that people recognize that we need to rehearse all of these different things that have happened in the past to other people long before we were on the stage, right? Now that it's our turn to exist on this single earth of ours, anything like these things can happen again to us tomorrow. They can happen to us. They can happen to our family members, to our friends, or to fellow motorists on the highway. Bridges have collapsed, right? Do you remember when bridges collapsed in Minnesota several years ago mm -hmm. because infrastructure is breaking down? Bridges don't last forever, right? These things happen. Flooding, right? Tremendous floods, right? We had tremendous flooding in eastern Nebraska several years ago. Rivers, 100-year floods, right? And, and, and the hurricanes and the flooding, the coastal flooding that we've experienced the last several hurricane seasons, these things are going to happen more frequently. They're not surprising anymore. So to think that these things are just unheard of and unprecedented is really to be naive. These things have been going on for a very long time, and they will continue to go on. Okay, so what's the lesson to take away from that? The lesson to take away from that is to be aware that things happen that are beyond your control, some of which you might be able to, might not be able to anticipate just because you haven't studied meteorological history or accidents on the highway or whatever. But always the lesson is, okay, recognize what's up to you in these hazardous, scary situations, these risky situations, right? How can you respond to them? The way that you respond to them is by making sure that your car is in good working order. Check your tires, check your brakes, make sure that your car is operating properly before you even get in the vehicle. And before you turn the ignition and start to drive your car, remind yourself that you're in an object that's several thousand pounds of steel and plastic and glass that's going to be hurtling down a road with lots and lots of other similarly large, heavy objects and recognize that you have to be alert at all times. Why do so many accidents occur? Sometimes there are tires that blow out, but more often than that, people are looking at their cell phones while they're driving. This is terribly dangerous. This is very, very bad driving behavior. It's a driving vice, if you will. So what's up to you is to steer clear of all driving vices. Maintain your vehicle, drive only when you need to, operate it safely, and if you get to your destination safely at the end of your trip, congratulations. <laughs> but there's no guarantee that you're going to. There's risk every time you get into a car, whether you're driving or you're a passenger. And it's simply not naive to deny that. It's foolish. Uh, last question. Do you believe that in Stoicism, um, once life ends in different ways, for some happy, joyful, peaceful, for others unhappy and not peaceful, 
Do you believe that um, there is overall peace, or what happens at that time from a Stoic perspective? Right. So, so one source of consolation or comfort that I think Stoics can draw from their worldview is to recognize the cyclical nature of how the cosmos works, right? Day turns into night, which turns into day again. Spring turns to summer, turns into fall, turns into winter, and then spring comes again, right? So there's this cyclical pattern. Things get wet, then they dry out. Then they get wet again, then they dry out. It gets hot, and then it gets cold. So there's this balance and cyclical rhythm of all these things that happen in nature. And one of the most fundamental patterns, of course, is birth, maturation, degeneration, and death. But death is simply the other side of the coin to birth. And so this is a classic example of how the Stoics refuse to judge death to be bad or birth and life to be good. They're neutral. They can be used either well or badly. And from the big cosmic perspective, ultimately, since they fit in an appropriate way into this cosmic whole, in a structured way, in a global perspective, they're good. So death isn't bad. Death is a necessary, natural part to the lifespan of any living thing, right? What's up to us is not to change our mortality. What's up to us is to accept the fact that we're mortal and to make the best of the lives that we are gifted by nature. We didn't choose when to be born. None of us even chose that we would be born. So what determined that we exist here at all? Answer, the universe did. Nature with a capital N decided that we would be born, that we would be born male or female, that we would be born to the parents, that we have at the place and time that the cosmos needed us, it burped us into existence. And so given that perspective, you see life as a gift which is on loan to you. It's not your permanent possession, right? We belong to the universe. It does not belong to us. And so the universe is going to recycle us again and produce another living thing when it sees fit. That's the proper way to understand the balance between life and death and the necessity and reciprocity of the two in this cosmic cycle, which is endless and faultless, blameless from the Stoic perspective. Beautiful. Uh, thank you. Is there anything additional that you'd like to add? Just that uh, I hope your your readers will take the opportunity to seek out wonderful sources of Stoic philosophy in Seneca, in Epictetus, in Marcus Aurelius, and hoping that uh, some of the books that I've written on these topics are helpful to them as they learn more about Stoicism. I Yes, and I highly recommend, uh, dear listeners, that you uh, check out uh, Professor Stevens' website, again, williamostevens.com. That's S-T-E-P-H. Um, and again, your new book will be coming out very soon, and it will be available at all the major book shops, including, of course, Amazon and other retailers. Um, a big thank you for being on the Archetypal Mosaic. Oh, thank you, Michael. I really enjoyed it.